Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Healing Talks series of family webinars. This is our second topic in the series um, called Sex and Healthy Relationships, Respect, Consent, and Care. My name is Penny Wyatt, and I am the Director of Family Programs at Tulane, and I'll be hosting the webinar. So we are very pleased that you've joined us today for this important topic. Um, several university staff from key departments will dic discuss tonight our expectations, education, and support for students to approach sex and healthy relationships with respect, consent, and care. And our goal is to provide families with this background about Tulane and these topics so that you can have some family to student conversations over the summer before your student arrives at Tulane to help provide a foundation for the continued experience and education and engagement with these issues they will have during their university journey. So I am very happy to introduce my colleagues who are the panelists for this evening's webinar. So they are um, Allison Co-Francesco, who is the Director of Case Management and Support Services at Tulane, Marcus Foster, who is the Assistant Provost for Title IX Compliance and Education, Jennifer Hunt, who's the Assistant Director for the Well for Health Promotion, which is part of our Campus Health Division, um, and Christopher Zaccarda, who's the Director of the Office of Student Conduct. So I will now turn things over to the panelists. They will join us um, and we will get started with Marcus Foster. Who will begin. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. And let me start by virtually welcoming you to the Tulane community. Um, as a proud alum of this university, I want to let you know that you and your students have made a wonderful decision and made the right choice. And we're really excited to have your students um, join us in, in a few short weeks. So um, as Penny has said, my name is Marcus Foster, he, him, his pronouns, and I am the assistant provost for Title IX compliance and education. Um, and before I dive in and talk a little bit about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I do want to just acknowledge the difficulty that comes with talking about this topic and these issues. And I want to commend each one of you and um, thank you for being here because it is because of spaces such as this that we are able to normalize this topic. And it is our hope by having conversations and forums such as this, we are able to give folks the, the tools and skills necessary to be able to navigate this often difficult um, field and, and these difficult conversations that um, involve trauma and heightened emotions and, and ongoing um, feelings and emotions as, as we um, process that experience. So um, just quickly want to talk a little bit about Title IX as a, as a grounding principle. So it is a um, federal law created in 1972 that uh, prohibited discrimination on the basis of sex. Um, so in its uh, original format, it was a um, statute that looked to ensure that there was gender equity in collegiate athletics. Um, over the years, that um, statute has evolved to encompass a number of different behaviors, a number of different actions that are discriminated because they um, occur without the consent of another individual. So specifically when we're talking about Title IX and we're talking about um, prohibited behaviors, um, individuals are prohibited from engaging in behaviors such as um, sexual assault, rape, 
uh, dating or domestic violence, sexual exploitation, sexual harassment, whether that be physical or verbal harassment, stalking, and also Title IX is here to support and protect parenting, pregnant and parenting um, individuals. So what my office does, I, I like to consider the Title IX office as a, a central hub. We work very closely with different departments and divisions across the university at both our uptown campus as well as our downtown campus to make sure that the university is appropriately preventing and responding to incidents of sexual violence, incidents of dating violence. Um, it is our mindset, it is our perspective at Tulane that no one person can eradicate or eliminate sexual violence. We know that these are prevalent issues that impact not just our campus community, but impact our state, our city, um, the country, and it, internationally for that matter, the world. Um, so it really does take each and every one of us, all of us to um, take ownership in speaking out and working with one another to hold those who are engaging in these types of problematic behaviors accountable. So we work very closely with stakeholders, whether that be faculty, staff, or students to raise awareness on what behaviors are prohibited and why they are prohibited. Um, we do so by providing a number of different um, learning and formal, formal and informal opportunities for folks to learn about um, the policies and practices that we have in place, um, as well as their rights and the responsibilities that we have as members of our campus community. Um, we also work um, throughout the life cycle of the student to try to have these conversations embedded throughout um, their time here at Tulane. So um, we believe that this cannot just be a one-off conversation. So throughout your students' time at, at, at our university, these are going to be conversations that are ongoing and a part of ongoing discussions and part of the um, conversation. Because as I said, we really wanna make sure that students are not only aware of the behaviors that are prohibited, but how to um, seek out resources should they be negatively impacted, should they be harmed by any form of sexual or physical violence. And for those who may be supporting a friend, a family member, or a loved one, we want to make sure that they are aware of the resources that are here for them. Um, we know that folks who process trauma are dealing with all kinds of different feelings and emotions. And the last thing we would want is for um, your student to feel that um, they are on an island or they have to figure this out by themselves. So um, we really want to raise awareness and let folks know that there are individuals, there are offices all across our campus that are here to support them, to provide information and allow them to make the decision that is in their best interest. So one thing about Title IX is we will never force um, a, a process or a resolution on a student. We wanna make sure that our students are the ones who are in control and they are the ones who um, are, are working collaboratively with us. Um, we wanna make sure that everyone who is engaging and interacting with those students are um, trauma-informed. They are understanding of um, different identities that each one of us hold and making sure that we are minimizing any additional harm that may be, be had due to um, ongoing interactions or ongoing discussions about that initial um, incident of trauma. So um, at this time, I'll turn it over to our, my colleague, I believe Chris, you're up next. So Chris can talk a little bit about um, the policies and practices that his office oversees in um, the Office of Student Conduct. But thank you again for being here. And I'm looking forward to seeing some of the questions that y'all have uh, momentarily. So thank you. And thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, so again, my name is Dr. Zakarta, and I'm the Director of Student Conduct at Tulane. And my role, uh, as Marcus indicated, is the Office of Student Conduct is responsible for enforcing all elements 
and, and tenets of the code of student conduct. I'll talk about what that means in just a second. Uh, so we do that in a variety of different ways, some of them preventative and some of them responsive as it relates to, uh, to an incident. <clears throat> but the code of student conduct outlines the behavioral expectations for all students whether they're undergraduate, graduate, professional students, whether they're part-time or full-time or online. Um, it also includes those students that perhaps are on uh, some sort of break, whether it's summer break like we are right now or some other sort of pause from the university. And it starts at matriculation and goes all the way through permanent separation, which usually means graduation. Uh, it includes behavior that is both on and off campus. And so those behavioral expectations that are outlined in the Code of Student Conduct, as well as the process by which we address concerns or allegations of misconduct, um, that is the Code of Student Conduct itself and what outlines how the university would respond for formal complaints. Now, this does include things that you would expect, which would include violations of our drug or alcohol policy, hazing policies as well. Uh, the drug and alcohol policy, again, applies both on and off campus, but it also includes things related to social, romantic, and sexual relationships as well. And so as a result, my office is charged with the task of adjudicating um, allegations of sexual harassment, sexual misconduct, sexual assault, stalking, intimate partner violence, and sexual exploitation. That is done through a variety of different uh, different mechanisms. Again, those processes which are outlined in our code um, in great detail. But just to give you a very brief overview, we have both formal and informal processes. Uh, the formal processes that we have, which are outlined by the Department of Education in, in most settings, um, that includes an investigation you know, when, when we have a formal complaint and the complainant uh, wishes the university to take formal action. That investigation process and adjudication process, uh, again, is spelled out in our code, and that case is turned over to one of our university investigators. Those investigators um, are well-trained, uh, to echo what Marcus shared earlier, they are trained in trauma-informed care, um, so that any individual that is going through this process, whether it be an individual that is being accused or is an individual that has been harmed, or even uh, an individual that may have been a witness uh, to, to the allegation, to the incident, um, that all of those individuals um, are treated with, with the care and respect that they, that they uh, deserve. And so that investigation, all of the steps along that way from beginning to resolution, all of those are informed by a trauma-informed uh, trauma and care process. That formal process, again, which is outlined by the Department of Education, uh, does have some requirements that include for those cases that happen on campus and meet the formal legal definition of a Title IX allegation, uh, that does include an investigation as well as some form of, of live hearing. Um, for those cases that happen off campus, uh, the, the live hearing is not an element of that process, but there is still that full formal thorough investigation. And then ultimately both cases come to some resolution of, uh, with the finding of responsible or not responsible. If there is a finding of responsibility, then there are outcomes or sanctions that are associated with that case. Those are uh, created with a variety of influences, including uh, prior history, including uh, sort of acknowledgement or possible understanding of, of the behavioral concerns, as well as the wishes of the complainant, the individual that has been harmed. That's an overview of the formal process. The informal process uh, in the informal process, both all parties involved, the complainant or complainants, the respondent and respondents, that they come to a mutual agreement through shuttle negotiation, usually through me as the director, in terms of what would be the appropriate outcomes. And those outcomes can be rooted in wellness. Those outcomes can be rooted in restoration or restorative justice, restorative practices, uh, which is an integral part of our resolution process. They can be rooted in education. Uh, they can be rooted in service. And so once those individuals come to a mutual agreement about the resolution, about what tenants would be incorporated into that informal resolution, uh, then I, I, as the manager, help all of those parties meet those conditions uh, until ultimately 
all of the elements of that informal resolution are completed. And so all of the individuals, whether they're in a formal or an informal process, um, they will have some assistance, they will have some support as they're going through those processes that can be in the form of a family member or an attorney, or we have some university trained advisors as well that support those students that are going through that process. Uh, lastly, is those individuals that are going through uh, those processes as well, they're also paired with a case manager, which is the perfect segue to introduce uh, my, my uh, colleague, Allison Cofrancesco, who is from the Office of Case Management and Victim Support Services. You're muted, Allison. Allison. <laughs> oh my gosh, you would think with COVID and everything, I would have realized that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> but anyway, hello. Um, as Chris said, I am um, Allison Cofrancesco. I'm the Director of Case Management and Victim Support Services. Um, kind of an overarching um, goal of our office is we reach out to students who are experiencing any type of difficulties. So that could range from um, mental health concerns, short-term illnesses, family emergencies, but we also reach out to students who um, may be the victim of a crime um, or may also be accused of crime, of a crime. So essentially we want students to, um, when we meet with students, we want them to know kind of what their options are. We want them to feel safe on campus and we go through um, you know, safety planning and um, help them kind of think through um, what's gonna be the best, what, are, what the best options are for them moving forward. We talk to them about reporting options and also um, options regarding medical care and make counseling referrals if that's needed and help them kind of navigate through what their academic options might look like. Um, if it's if they do want to pursue reporting options, we connect them with um, Dr. Zakarda's office and or we could also connect them with the New Orleans Police Department as well so that they can report to them. Um, we get our referrals from a lot of different places. The main one is um, through our online reporting system, which is tulane.edu forward slash concerns. Also, if you just Google Tulane concerns, it comes up. It's a report that's open to the public and we um, get those in real time. We always have somebody that's on call who reviews those reports and follows up if there's any kind of emergency. Um, also, we have somebody that's available um, by phone on call. So if there's um, some sort of victimization that happens um, and they want to reach out and get immediate assistance, they can by, by calling that number. We also just get self-referrals as well. We have students that just walk into our office. We have walk-in hours um, and certainly make ourselves available to, um, to assist students. Um, that's just, that's kind of an, an overall kind of view. I'm happy to answer any questions, any kind of more specific questions that you guys might have, um, but I'm actually gonna turn it over to Jennifer. Hey everyone, my name is Jennifer Hines. I'm the Associate Director of the Welfare Health Promotion. I use she and her pronouns. Just for some context, the Welfare Health Promotion is the prevention health education arm of Campus Health. So Campus Health is a pretty large entity. It includes uh, the Student Health Center, which is where students can go for their medical care, the Counseling Center, the Pharmacy, Campus Recreation, and then the Welfare Health Promotion, which is a team of diverse professionals from varying backgrounds that provide preventative health education for the campus community around a couple of centric, central topics. I'm here to talk about sexual health and sexual violence prevention today, but we also talk to your students about alcohol and other drugs, mental health, stress management, sleep hygiene, kind of all of those really essential pillars of well-being. And so my role um, is to really help lead the campus community around sexual violence prevention and sexual health. And, and what does that mean? So sexual violence prevention is about giving young people um, the skills, knowledge, beliefs, behaviors to make healthy decisions around their sexual health, their relationships, their own identity and well-being, 
and to also um, prevent them from making harmful decisions that hurt other people. And so um, that's kind of the approach that we take. And we really focus on empowering students with information that they can use in their own lives in the ways that seem um, most useful to them to make good decisions around their health, their safety, their well-being, and ultimately their success as a student or as a professional after their time at Tulane. So next, I would just like to um, share with everyone this list of the ways that students will learn more about this, this whole topic. Oftentimes, parents will ask if we're reviewing these things in the summer or at, you know, before students arrive or through a webinar that's you know, at a particular point in time, they'll say, well, you're giving us this information now, but how do the students get this? So we just wanted you to, to see this list and I won't go through everything, but I'll highlight a few different things that some of this education and preparation starts in the summer before they even arrive. So they get a series of navigator e-newsletters that will um, include this topic and some education. They have to do some online education modules on sexual health and sexual literacy. Um, and um, those they will do you know this summer and it's all part of the modules that they have for orientation topics um, they can also participate in these webinar series or you'll participate and then have a conversation with them um, and then those things um, also continue once they arrive for the orientation program which is called hullabaloo hello and that goes from move in to september 1st so they'll have a review in their floor meeting of the code of conduct um, there will be a presentation um, during orientation about understanding and, prevent, and um, understanding and preventing sexual violence. And then you'll see again these departments that um, you've already you know heard about um, are involved. The students will live in this environment where resources are offered, programs are held. Um, you know, education is presented in multiple ways. Um, and so there's just a list of several different things there from, you know, sort of signature programs to month long awareness months um, and those types of things. So, Jen, and when you want to elaborate on there. Yeah. And Penny, with that amazing visual guide, that's really helpful. And that's a great segue for me to talk about that. Um, so to, to kind of drill into what Penny was just uh, overviewing for us. Sexual violence prevention and education is not a one and done thing. So um, there is often a lot of focus and concern around what are you doing during orientation to prepare my students for college life. Um, but the reality is, is that orientation can be such an overwhelming time that while we touch on these topics, we make sure that students are getting sexual violence prevention and sexual health education often and continually throughout not only their first year, but their tenure as Tulane students. So I'm going to talk about what we do before, what we do at orientation, and then what we do throughout the first year, and then highlight some of the things that we're doing throughout the tenure of a Tulane student. So as uh, Penny just mentioned, we have our pre-arrival preparation. So part of that is programs like this, um, parent programs, guides that you might receive, you're receiving outreach from new student uh, programs and first year programs, and they're really talking to you about how you're going to acculturate to campus and learn how to be a Tulane student. And part of that is sexual violence prevention curriculum, but you haven't yet gotten some of the um, content that's going to be really specific to that. That's going to come in a little over a week around the 1st of July. And what those are going to look like is some pre matriculation courses that are facilitated by campus health. They cover a couple of topics like mental health and alcohol and other drugs, but they also specifically talk about sexual violence prevention. Um, and those, those modules include three separate modules. Uh, so we're not just taking this lightly. We ask your students to spend a good amount of time on this. Um, the first of those modules is sexual health for students. That's a very 101 
um, sexual health education, kind of the um, biology education that would be most age appropriate for like an eighth or ninth grader, but we know many of our students in the United States are not receiving that education. And then sexual literacy for students, which is a sex education course that might be more appropriate for a, a ninth or 10th grader. It's really more about communication, boundaries, healthy relationships, identifying signs of abuse, resources, making empowered decisions around relationships and your sexuality. And that includes making the decision to not be sexually active, um, to not explore sexuality or to maybe save that for a different time in life. And that includes content around that. So what we're really talking about is empowering students to make the decisions that are best for them around their relationships, their sexual health and their sexuality. And those are based in the values that they inherited from um, their parents and from their upbringing and from their school. So we're really encouraging them to listen to themselves, to listen to their values, um, to listen to their instincts and to make decisions that, that are right for them. Um, and then there's sexual misconduct for students. And what this is more focused at is kind of the very basics of what sexual harassment, sexual violence are, um, what sexual assault is, how to identify those things, how to intervene as a peer if you see an unhealthy dynamic, and then what kind of resources exist for students. So your students are, are actually taking all of that material before they even step onto campus. And the reason for that is that we want to make sure that before they even get onto campus, before they're even starting to have the interact with some of those more challenging experiences, or even kind of start to think about what relationships might look like for them in college, that they're already, they already have that material so that they're already um, kind of informed and have those skills before they set foot here. Then once they're on campus, they go through new student orientation. And part of that new student orientation has a couple of different um, health topics. And one of those is sexual violence prevention. Uh, that programming is led by our extraordinary team of peer advocates. Uh, the organization is called SAFE, which stands for Sexual Aggression Peer Hotline and Education Organization. And they are a group of students who receive 40 hours of initial training and 20 hours of annual training to provide confidential peer support services around sexual violence. And so they are not by any means counselors or professionals, case managers. They leave that to the professionals on campus, but they are peer advocates who are able to help connect students with important sources of support, information resources so that they can get connected to those professionals on campus. They lead um, an hour long workshop and then small group debriefing sessions that every single new student goes through. So as um, on the second day of new student orientation, they go through a workshop where they learn again about sexual violence and prevention. And they also are immediately kind of introduced to a community on campus of students who can support them, who can educate them and who can connect them to resources around campus. So that all happens um, kind of in the first months that a Tulane student joins our community and before they even really step foot on campus or have time on campus. And then after new student orientation, our students start to think, who do I want to be? How do I want to get um, acquainted with things? What, where do I want to find my spot on campus? They're going to start seeing sexual violence prevention um, integrated into those various touch points. So if they decide they want to become a member of a fraternity or sorority, they are going to go through the Potential New Member Education Series, which is a wonderful program facilitated by Office of Fraternity and Sorority Programs that requires any student who's even thinking about rushing for a fraternity to go through a series of educational workshops, um, identity building, expectation building sessions where they're kind of learn what does it mean to be a member of this community? And part of those are sexual violence prevention requirements. Um, we also just initiated a new all-in sexual violence prevention plan. And in that plan is 12 separate touch points that happen throughout the tenure of a student, like living on campus, studying abroad, taking on a new internship, becoming a student employee, where sexual violence prevention education is actually part of each of those steps in their lives. So not only are they going to get quite a bit of sexual violence prevention and sexual health education just in their first couple of 
months and first year here. It's also going to happen consistently throughout various touch points that the majority of our students go through, like studying abroad, like joining a fraternity or sorority, like moving off campus onto an off campus um, uh, residence. All of those things will have sexual violence prevention indexed into those experiences. Penny, was there anything else that you wanted me to cover just in this initial section? I feel like I just spoke a lot. Um, I think you just said it was for fraternity members, but it is for fraternity and sorority potential new Absolutely. members. Absolutely. It's for fraternity and sorority members, and that's of all of our fraternity and sororities. So that's our multicultural fraternities and sororities. That's our um, inter, uh, sorry, uh, inter for, oh, I always get this IFC. I always forget what the IFC is. It's also our Panhellenic organizations that anybody who wants to be part of the Greek community at Tulane goes through the potential new member series. I'm sorry if I misspoke. That's okay. Um, and then I think that there are those, um, there are additional student peer professionals who aren't as um, specifically oriented to this particular topic as the safe organization, but um, that these other, um, student mentors, volunteers, they're, they're trained peer professionals. So the, even the first year seminar peer mentors will mention it and make referrals to SAFE and um, Campus Health. The peer health educators also address this and all the resident advisors and housing resident advisors also get training. The TIDES mentors, yes. um, no, the Tulane, the Tulane student and academic affairs communities have really prioritized making sure that if you are student facing, you have resources around um, how to be a supportive uh, respondent to, or how to supportively respond to um, disclosures of sexual violence, how to intervene in situations that kind of don't seem quite right, and then what resources exist for students. So um, if a student is interacting with a, a peer mentor, a peer advocate, a peer educator, they're going to know about these resources and are going to, going to have the information that they need to connect them with professionals. One other thing that I think um, parents would be interested in knowing is that the sexual assault response resources are listed in every course syllabus. So it's something that every single professor builds into their syllabus. And so I think that that's a really useful thing that, you know, if, if it's, we, we promote all those resources in so many different ways, but every student has, you know, four or five syllabi. So they've got that information, kind of, you know, somewhere that is a document that they refer to all the time. So I think and that's a good thing for families to know about. And I think another good thing for families to know about Penny is that um, we really, we believe that these conversations should start uh, before students arrive. And ideally they're happening with the people that students really respect and look up to, which is their families. Um, so there are two guides, Penny, you anticipated my thoughts. There are two guides that we have for parents. Um, th this by no means is meant to tell you you know, how to have these conversations with your young person. But if you're kind of thinking, I would like to have these conversations, I'm not quite sure where to start, or maybe I would like some new ideas or some new, um, maybe like pop culture references that I could use to start these conversations. I do want to direct you to two guides that the Welfare Health Promotion has created in um, concert with the Title IX office. One is the guide uh, for parents to join the conversation around talking about sex and sexuality. And the other one is a guide for talking to your student about sexual violence. So the guide for kind of joining the conversation around sex and sexuality is Pay, really um, identifying that sex is often an uncomfortable topic to talk about for most anyone, especially within a family unit often, and especially when you're talking about, um, you know, a, a parent and a young person or a guardian and a young person that can sometimes be kind of a, a uncomfortable place to start. And so this guide is really meant to kind of help give some ideas about where you can start some suggestions about some resources or some other talking guides, and also to kind of acknowledge that in some cases, um, parents, guardians, families might feel like maybe they need more information before they start these conversations. So there's also resources here for if a, if you know a family member feels like they would like to learn more, explore more, there's some resources in there. 
And then the talking to your student about sexual violence, that's really a guide for how do you have these difficult conversations and then how do you take care of yourself while you're having those conversations? Um, I can't imagine many things that would be more upsetting than, you know, thinking about your student possibly being affected by any form of violence. And so we acknowledge that and this guide is really to help parents think about what might be an important topic to talk about? How can I tell them about resources to help their friends or themselves as they need it? And then how do I establish myself as a safe person that if my student or one of their friends ever needed an adult to come and talk to, that they know that I'm one of those people. So both of those guides are available. Um, uh, Penny has linked where you can find them. Um, they'll be sent out also to parents. And so uh, this is a resource that I highly encourage you if you're looking for something along these lines. So just check out and see if there isn't something useful in there for you. Okay. And then we also wanted to um, show you that um, when you can access the slides when they're in the, um, the archive, there are some additional resources here um, that you may want to read over. And um, I don't know if perhaps um, Marcus would like to say a little bit about some of these things. I'll let you join us. Yep, not a problem. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we at Tulane want to make an environment that limits any barriers there may be when it comes to reporting. We want people to be able to safely disclose any incident that they may have had with sexual violence, with sexual misconduct, and we want to make it as seamless as possible. So um, as, as Allison had mentioned, we have an online reporting form where folks can um, go ahead and report that experience. They would provide um, a little bit of their contact information and then share as much or as little they're comfortable sharing. Um, and then once that um, online report is um, once that report comes through our student conduct software, um, a case manager then will go ahead and reach out to them and begin that process of um, seeing what those immediate needs are and ongoing needs that they may have as they are going through um, that traumatic experience. Um, next, you'll see the results, the executive report and the action plan of the 2022 Sexual Misconduct Climate Survey. Um, we believe in being as transparent as possible. So um, in the spring of 2022, we conducted a campus-wide climate survey for all of our um, students, undergraduate, graduate, and professional students, online students, and part-time students. And we wanted to learn more about their experiences with sexual violence. This was the second time as an institution we conducted a sexual misconduct climate survey, the first being in um, the spring of 2017. Um, so with these um, links, you will have an opportunity to read the findings of uh, the climate survey, as well as our intentional strategic plan to combat prevent and respond to incidents of sexual misconduct. We understand, as I mentioned earlier, that it takes each one of us to um, see a change in culture, to see these ideas and values re uh, uh, regarding consent and healthy relationships and healthy sexuality. Um, the only way we are going to see those concepts reverberate across the campus is if we have um, that culture change and that change in mentality. So you will see our comprehensive plan to um, work with as many stakeholders, as many community members as possible. Um, we have spent months um, putting together this plan and it is because the scope of the problem is so large that we need to do everything within our power as an institution um, to confront this public health crisis head on. Um, so there you will see the executive report and the action plan. There will also be a um, an opportunity for your students to attend a, a in-person um, session in the fall. We have an annual Shifting the Paradigm um, conversation that um, is an opportunity for us to release to the campus community the data and statistics from the prior academic year. So we come together as a community 
many of the folks that you've heard from today um, share information such as the number of cases that were disclosed to the Title IX office in the previous academic year, the types of cases. We will do a breakdown of the number of incidents alleging sexual harassment versus the number of incidents in involving intimate partner violence, sexual exploitation, et cetera, et cetera, as well as how those um, um, uh, how those uh, reports were resolved. Was that uh, resolved through the informal or the formal process? Was this an opportunity that a student just wanted to report um, and seek um, accommodations and supportive services through CMVSSS? CMVSS. Um, so all of that information is provided to students. As I said, we want to be um, as transparent as possible. So um, with those two links, you can read the executive report and action plan, as well as we have an interactive tool that breaks down the data um, in, in disaggregates the data in a way where you can look at the rates of a particular behavior based on the gender or the gender identity, the sexual orientation, the race ethnicity, as well as whether the individual is um, whether the individuals are were a graduate student or a graduate professional student or undergraduate students. Um, I think it's important to know we had a response rate of 29%. Um, fill out, so approximately close to 3,000 students um, filled out the climate survey. So we do believe that it is representative of the experience of, of so many um, of the students who are members of our community. And we know that that one act of violence, one act of harm is, is one too many. So we really want um, folks to be able to know the scope, but more importantly, figure out and, and understand where they fit in as we talk and think about the solution to the problem. Um, next, you'll see uh, some of the um, links just for the student code of conduct that Dr. Zakarda had mentioned earlier. Also wanna make sure that Title IX is here to protect all parties. We believe in a fundamentally fair and respectful process. So whether an individual has been harmed or accused, they have rights, they have resources. Um, individuals, regardless of whether they're a complainant or a, a, a respondent, deserve to be heard, deserve to be supported. And we have those um, procedures and protocols in place to go ahead and support um, all students. And then lastly, we have um, some crucial information that has come about within the last um, calendar year as we approach the one year anniversary of um, the Dobbs decision that overturned uh, Roe v. Wade. Um, as I mentioned at the start of my, of my comments, Title IX is also here to protect pregnant and parenting students. We believe every student has a right to seek the reproductive health services of their choosing, to have access to a licensed medical practitioner and do so in a way that is, is indicative to where they are as a person, that, that meets the needs of, of them individually. Um, so this outlines some of the services and, and resources that are put in place for um, students who wish to know more about the reproductive health services that are available on campus within the state of Louisiana, as well as other states. Um, we do believe in supporting all students as they make those medical decisions, those difficult medical decisions. So we, as I said earlier, we never want a student to feel that they are alone should they have to make some very difficult decisions regarding their reproductive health. So we put together um, what I believe is a comprehensive and an up-to-date guide on how to navigate um, uh, those, 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 those moments. And um, we thought it would be beneficial to also share that with you. And then lastly, as you will see the all in, uh, .tulane .edu, that is our um, central hub 
to combat sexual violence. So uh, much of what you've heard today, uh, when we're thinking about the prevention education, the response and resources that are available to our students, as well as the vision as we continue to move forward, are outlined in far greater detail um, on that website. So I encourage you to spend some time um, on our all-in website and again, see how you and your student can um, actively uh, combat the prevalence of sexual violence, not only just on Tulane's campus, but society as a whole. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I appreciate your time and your thought and insights and sharing them with our um, participants. So now um, is, is the time when you can type in questions and I will um, kind of go through those and um, offer them to the, the appropriate staff member to answer. So we invite you to submit your questions now. And um, the first one is, and I may not pronounce this drug correctly, is um, Levin Orgestrel available on the, at the campus pharmacy. I would ha be happy to um, answer that. So we do provide a, both a uh, plan B, so a levodestrin, um, levodestrinol, uh based pill, like a plan B. Ours is, um, I think it's called E-Contra. It's, it's a generic of uh, plan B. We also have Ella in stock. Um, at our pharmacy. So let me talk about how you access either. So at our pharmacy um, and in a vending machine in our LBC, but on at our pharmacy, um, we have free emergency contraception, no questions asked, no documentation needed um, for any member of the Tulane or Loyola community that would like to access it. All they have to do is walk into the pharmacy, request um, emergency contraception, Plan B, EC, uh, the Plan B pill, however they would like to ask it. And we have a little tutorial on um, confidential ways to ask for it. They can receive it from um, the pharmacy. We also have a student organization on campus that uh, receives inventory from the pharmacy. So it is um, medication that is from a, a licensed pharmaceutical supplier that is um, managed through the pharmacy, uh, actually gives stock to a student organization who then provides um, on-campus delivery of emergency contraception to students who request it. That is about 10% of the total inventory that we deliver goes through the organization called Big EC EC. So the majority is distributed through our um, pharmacy, but it's an excellent option for students that want it outside of pharmacy hours or who maybe don't want to go through the pharmacy. We also have Ella on campus. Ella is a, another form of emergency contraception. Um, it's excellent because it has a slightly longer window of um, efficacy. It also um, has the same e efficacy on day one as on day five. So it works a little bit differently than plan B. And it also works for people with slightly higher BMIs than what plan B works for. And so Ella is a prescription-based drug. And what we do is we um, can provide, we can prescribe Ella both through in-person or telehealth appointments on campus. We also expedite, expedite those appointments um, to ensure that students are getting in timely. And then we can prescribe Ella and they can pick it up from the student pharmacy. Um, Ella is not free. Uh, so that is something that we're working on. And that is a goal for us to maybe expand access to also include free Ella. Um, but I think that that is everything that I wanted to go through. We also, just to talk about what safer sex options that we have on campus, we also have completely free barrier methods of safer, uh, safer sex supplies. So that includes internal condoms, external condoms, dental dams, um, as well as pregnancy tests. And those are distributed at about 40 locations around campus, including at the student health center, but in other cases, uh, locations both on the uptown and downtown campus to make them as accessible as possible. Thank you, Jennifer. So um, families, it's 
It's question time. So if there are any other questions that you want to submit, we're open to that. And we'd like to be able to help fill in some blanks or give some more background information. I don't see any other questions. So I just want to, here's one. How is Tulane addressing the use of whippets and its potential relation to sexual assault? Uh, everybody has an opinion. I'll, I'll fill in if there's anything else. The first thing that we're doing as it relates to whippets in general, whippets are a prohibited item on campus and that is outlined in our code. Uh, with some of the pre-matriculation courses that Jennifer and I have been working on development, we'll, we will be also, uh, we'll be adding information into those courses uh, making sure that students understand not just the illegality and the, the code violation, but also perhaps some of the negative health consequences associated with inhalants, including including whippets. The only thing I would add, thank you for that, Dr. Zaccardo. The only thing I would add is part of the um, strategic plan that we outlined following the results of the climate survey is understanding the relationships that need to be developed and nurtured with our community partners. So those individuals outside of the Tulane bubble. So those um, merchants who may be inclined to sell uh, whippets to our students and understanding, as, as Dr. Zakarta had mentioned, that the negative health implications they have and the weaponization that drugs and alcohol or whippets may have um, for those who wish to perpetrate um, sexual violence on another person. So uh, not only educating our students on the fact that they are prohibited, but also working with those local vendors, local merchants in the surrounding um, uptown area to make sure that they are aware that that um, they too have a role if we want to see a reduction in, in sexual violence. And I'll just add on to what Dr. Zakarta and, and Marcus said. Um, you know, I, anecdotally speaking, um, whippets are definitely not the illicit substance that we see most heavily implicated in drug facilitated sexual assault. Um, however, in general, when we're talking about drug facilitated sexual assault, we are really focusing on um, uh, really normalizing with our students um, this idea that drugs and alcohol um, can but should not, and the expectation both university from a university standards, but also from a human being perspective is that um, weaponizing drugs or alcohol against another human being to incapacitate them in order to perpetrate sexual violence or commit sexual violence against them um, is absolutely not just a, a morally unacceptable thing, but also a completely unacceptable behavior um, amongst our community standards. And of course, Dr. Zicarda or, or Marcus could speak more to those standards. But um, in general, when we talk about alcohol or other drugs, including whippets around sexual violence, we are really focused on talking to our students about their role and their responsibility around um, being attentive to the way substances impact consent and making sure that they are not harming other students or other um, human beings by being inattentive to that impact and really making sure that they understand the, in, the difference between intoxication, incapacitation, how those things impact consent, and that they are really being responsible partners or potential partners to um, their fellow community members. So in general, that's really the way we try to um, talk about substances and their impact on consent or their implication on sexual violence. I think the next question really sort of lives inside that context you just provided, but I'll, I'll um, submit this one to the panelists. Have there been incidences of sexual assault resulting from the use of date rape drugs? So one of the findings that came out of the climate survey was that, as I mentioned earlier, that alcohol and drugs are being weaponized by perpetrators to um, harm 
members of the Tulane community. Um, it was heartbreaking to hear that over 90% of our female identified students and 90, over 90% of our gender non-binary, non-conforming or transgender students and over 75% of our male students reported that they were incapacitated at the time they experienced rape or sexual assault. And incapacitation is a level that is beyond um, intoxication. So an individual is unable to um, comprehend what what they what is happening to them are not able to engage in any kind of knowing behavior. And we have seen as a community um, reports come in through the concerns reports of alleged um, druggings that happen. Um, in, in off-campus um, uh, uh, facilities, whether that be um, uh, parties that they may be attending or outside venues that they may be attending um, as they travel about the city. Um, what we really stress, and uh, Jennifer can talk a little bit more about the education that tries to combat, uh, the, 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 the burden is always going to be on the perpetrator. We do not want to justify or ever exonerate that type of behavior, but we also want to give those bystanders who may be out with a friend or someone they care about that knowledge and those tools to be able to confidently and comfortably be able to check in with their friend, to check in with their loved one, to make sure that they are feeling okay or, and what are the um, steps that they can take in the immediate aftermath if a person believes that they may have been drugged. So um, we've spent a good bit of the last academic year and these conversations have happened prior um, to the last year, but making sure that our students are aware that if they believe that they have been drugged, it is not their fault, they're not in trouble, and we are here to support them, whether that is transporting them to um, University Medical Center or a nearby hospital so they can, in fact, get a, a testing to see if there are any illegal substances within their system, providing transportation back to campus, but also that ongoing um, support and any necessary accommodations that may come um, as a result of any uh, potential druggings that may have occurred. And I'll also jump in. I think um, one thing that I would love uh, parents kind of partnership in is around this conversation of the impact of substances on consent. And I think that it's, uh, you know, because of media and kind of the, the way we culturally talk about this, a lot of the focus is often on um, drugs. So like roofies, things that um, can be slipped into a drink and incapacitate. And what we really find at Tulane and not just at Tulane, at, at colleges at large, is that alcohol is often the weapon of incapacitation. So it's not, um, and I think that this is important because this isn't about, uh, this is important from the perspective of, of thinking about how we're teaching young people to have healthy relationships and healthy interactions. Um, you don't have to slip something in somebody's drink to take advantage or weaponize the fact that they have been using substances and then are now incapacitated to that. So um, you for you do not have to slip somebody, something into somebody's drink. It is enough um, to, to go home with them when they are incapacitated after six drinks, right? So really having these conversations where we're moving away from this concept that it's only drugs, it's only things like roofies or Xanax that get slipped into people's drinks, but it is in fact often alcohol. Um, that is being used to incapacitate people either on purpose or kind of through a, a crime of opportunity um, where students are really not being attentive to the signs and symptoms of incapacitation and they are not um, deciding to uh, not partake in activity that night because their partners are showing those signs. And so we as a university focus a lot on educating young people about what are the signs of incapacitation, 
How do you identify those in yourself, your friends, um, potential partners, and really uh, giving students, empowering them to, to know to stop. You know, if, you're, if your partner or your friend is slurring their words, they're unsteady on their feet, maybe they're vomiting, um, they're showing um, in constants, those are signs that they're not available to consent to sexual activity and really teaching our students about those things so that they have those skills um, to use in their daily lives. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. We've gone a little bit over time, so I feel like we should wrap things up now. Um, you can always um, email families at tulane.edu if you have further questions, and I'll forward those on to the appropriate staff member. Um, but we um, welcome you to do that and to reach out anytime. Again, look for this um, information on the the archive for family webinars. And remember that we have two other um, topics in this Tulane Talk series coming up soon. So um, we always welcome your feedback too. So you can email that to families at tulane.edu to the, uh, that email address. Or if you have a short comment you wanna type in now before we close, that's also welcome. But we, um, we certainly appreciate feedback from families um, the things that you might appreciate that we're doing now may have been suggested by you know, some parents um, several years ago who are always trying to continually improve what we are offering. So we do appreciate your um, participation tonight and your interest in this topic and your support of your students. And I'd like to thank all the panelists one more time and just um, tell everybody to have a good evening. So thanks so much, everyone. Good night. <laughs>